you're on a gig, you ask for a little more of yourself in the monitor because you can't hear. What happens? Woo! Feedback, and not the constructive kind. So what do you do? We have options. Stay tuned and we're going to teach you how to deal with feedback in your monitor. Hey everybody, Matt Bell with the Electric Violin Shop. We're back with the From Classical to Radical series, where we're teaching classically trained violinists, violists, cellists, upright bass people, how to easily enter the world of amplified music. I'm a solid body electric guy myself, so I really don't deal with a lot of feedback in the monitors. Plus, I wear in-ear monitors, so that makes feedback even less likely. However, some of you may have decided that either an acoustic with a pickup or a purpose-built acoustic electric violin is the right tool for the job that you're on. Maybe you're still using a microphone. I don't know. In any case, sometimes you're going to have feedback and we're going to give you some tools today to maybe help you uh, cut back on that feedback. First, let's picture a microphone and a speaker setup. You've got a microphone that hears you talking. We'll use talking as an example. Pumps that into an amplifier back to a speaker and out into the world, right? If the speaker's loud enough that the microphone can hear that speaker as well, then the signal comes back through the microphone, through the amplifier into the speaker, back to the microphone, and it amplifies that some more, which pumps it back and makes it even louder. And the next thing you know, we have this feedback loop, and that's why it's called feedback. Why then, instead of hearing myself just get louder in a monitor, do I hear certain frequencies start to take off. It's always just one or two frequencies, right? Every frequency has a wavelength. So as the frequency gets higher, the wavelength gets shorter. Um, so 50 hertz is about where that thump of a kick drum comes in. The sound wave of a 50 hertz frequency sound is 22 feet long, pretty long. Um, your A string on your violin is 440 hertz. That, sound, that wavelength is about two and a half feet long. And then a harmonic E up on your E string is 1300 hertz or, or 1.3K. That wavelength is about 10 inches long. So in order for a frequency to feed back, it pretty much has to be on like a, a solid um, or a whole number multiple wavelength between the microphone and the speaker. So if I'm 30 inches from the speaker to the microphone, then that 1.3K wave waves through three times and it comes back into the microphone, maybe on the top of a wave, the crest of a wave, and, and that's what's coming out of the speaker is the crest of a wave. So those start to chase each other. If it's, if it's the opposite of that, you'll get destructive interference. If they're together, then you get constructive interference, and constructive interference is what we hear start to take off, right? That's why higher frequencies feed back more, is because it's a lot easier to get a multiple wavelength of a shorter frequency wave, if you can sort of picture that, right? I mean, it's hard to get a solid multiple of a 22-foot long wave. You'd have to be like almost exactly 22 feet from the speaker to the microphone. There are a couple of easy ways to kill feedback in that in that microphonic sense. You can turn down the volume so that the microphone cannot hear the speaker as well, or you can move the mic away from the speaker so that you've sort of killed that, that whole um, frequency wavelength where you've got the multiple, say if I'm 30 inches away and I go to 55 inches away, A, it cuts the volume because I'm further away, but it also disturbs that whole number multiple of wavelengths. So that's microphonic feedback. Um, and if you've got a microphone, that can sort of be where you're at. There's also resonant frequency feedback. And uh, I'm gonna apologize for this, I have an engineering degree. Every engineering student learns about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster in Washington. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge um, has a, had, <laughs> cause it's not there anymore, had a resonant frequency that was excited by the wind that was rushing through the valley that this bridge was in. And so the wind would come through and it would excite the resonant frequency in that bridge, much like you pulling your bow across the strings. And that bridge would start to move. Well, one day the wind was strong enough and the bridge started moving. And as the wind is exciting that frequency, no more bridge, okay? It was a big, big disaster. So that's, that's a resonant frequency. That's what can happen. 
your violin body has a number of these resonant frequencies. You can hear them when you when you tap on the body. There there are some signature uh, sounds that come out of that, right? And those frequencies are pretty much fixed for your particular instrument. So just like that bridge, um, if your violin has a resonant frequency around 150 hertz and it starts hearing 150 hertz, it's going to try to it's going to try to resonate or vibrate and it's going to take off. So there's really only two things you can do in that situation. You can physically dampen the violin um, and that can be done by, I mean, touching the violin or um, you can turn the speaker down. Because you still need to hear yourself play, turning down the speaker overall is really not a great option. Remember, you asked them to turn it up because you couldn't hear and if you can't hear, you can't play. So why don't we just turn down the frequencies that are causing the problem? It's only feeding back in one or two frequencies, right? So that's where EQ comes in. Now, if you missed our video on EQ, this would be a good time to check that out. Normally, a reputable sound company will have a 31 band EQ on every sound wedge that's on your stage. So if your violin starts feeding back at 150 hertz, your monitor engineer can just walk over to that 31 band and he can notch it out at 150 hertz your speaker is now not putting out as much 150. That's not going to excite that vibration in your violin and uh, everything's peachy. How do you know which frequency is the problem if we're on the gig, right? Well, an experienced sound engineer is going to know roughly what frequency a given uh, sound is in because that's his job. It's sort of like you, you hear a note and you go, okay, well, that's an A. That's an open A, right? Because I can hear that. Well, engineers are the same way. They will know when they hear a frequency, that's 150 or that's 5K or that's, you know, that's 600, whatever it is. If you don't have one of those guys, you're sort of trying to do this yourself. One of the things that we usually do um, is actually a little counterintuitive. If I'm getting a frequency that's starting to feed back on me, I'll go over to that 31 band and I'll sort of guess about where to start. Um, and then I will start boosting individual frequencies. I'll push one up. No, that didn't take off. No, that one didn't take off, and I'll push it up. Woo! That one takes off. That's the one. So what you do when it starts to take off, if you find the right one, then you dump that one. Okay? Going through and cutting and hoping the frequency goes away, you're going to end up dishing out the whole middle section of your, of your EQ. You're going to end up with a really hollow-sounding instrument. It, it's, nobody's happy with that. So. Now, we did talk about dampening, and everybody's going to have a little seizure here when I say this, but this is, this is a common industry practice you can decrease the resonance of your violin body by covering the F holes. I've seen some big name, big money guys, and I'm, I don't name names here, but there, there's some, some guys that have been on big tours. I've seen them on the Grand Ole Opry. I've seen them on CMT, big time guys that I know. Um, they just throw a piece of gaff tape over the F hole. Um, make sure you use gaff tape and not duct tape. Duct tape's gonna ruin the finish of your violin. If you're in a, in a band setting, there's probably a roll of gaff tape around. It looks like black duct tape, but it's, 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 a, it's more sort of a cloth thing. It's, it's expensive, so don't be using this stuff like crazy because somebody will get really angry. Gaff tape is strong enough to stay on the violin, but it, it shouldn't hurt the finish on the violin. It's probably worth maybe a little test square somewhere. I wouldn't throw gaff tape on a Guarneri, but I'm probably not gonna carry a Guarneri into a bar. If, if you're not scared to bring your violin into the bar, it, it's probably cool to throw a little piece of tape over the F-hole. So we mentioned turning down and we mentioned dampening. There's one more trick at our disposal before we decide to ditch this acoustic violin thing entirely. Remember we talked about wavelength distances between the speaker and the mic? What happens if we could turn a whole wavelength into a half a wavelength? So I've got a I've got a whole wavelength that, you know, I've got a peak coming into the violin at the same time I got a peak coming out of the speaker. What if I could flip that wave upside down? So that when I've got a peak coming out of the speaker, I've got a valley coming back into the instrument or the mic. That is what the phase button on a lot of your higher end DIs or on a uh, on a sound console, it'll usually be up near the top near a pad button. That's what that phase button does. And it looks like like a little zero with a with a line through it. It's actually the Greek letter phi. And, and so that's that means phase. Now, this gets a little technical, but more or less what it does is it flips the phase of those waves. It flips all those waves upside down. So keep in mind, when you flip that phase, you may solve your problem at 150 hertz and you've created another problem at 180 or some, some other frequency, right? But it's, it's a last ditch solution that sort of works sometimes. So if you can't get it with EQ and you can't get it with dampening and you can't get it with, you know, moving the distance from the speaker just a little bit, um, 
you can always try to hit that phase button and see if it'll flip that problem frequency around for you. There's sort of one last discussion. I know some people are going to ask about this. There are uh, effects boxes, actually rack mount units, called automatic feedback destroyers or feedback eliminators. Everybody's sort of got a different name for theirs. This is a device that monitors your signal constantly and it looks for frequencies that are starting to take off. And when it finds a frequency that's starting to take it off, it uses an ultra thin EQ slice and it does exactly what I said we would do on a 31 band. It just notches that frequency out when it finds one that's starting to take off. Sort of the downside of some of these is that uh, a lot of people complain that it kills their tone. Um, because that, based on how sensitive you set it, that feedback destroyer is looking for certain frequencies and, and maybe those are some of the frequencies that that cause your tone to have the richness and the roundness or the fullness or the brightness, whatever it is that you like about your tone, some of those frequencies may get caught accidentally by that feedback destroyer. It doesn't know the difference between you swelling a note and feedback. All it knows is I see this frequency and it's starting to take off. So sometimes an automatic feed destroyer can be a positive solution for you. Sometimes it just sort of makes a hash of things. I've never really worked with one because I've always had good engineers to work with and then uh, sort of in the last few years I've been working with in-ear monitors. If you've got in-ear monitors, it's almost impossible to feed back. So sometimes the solution, EQ isn't working, moving isn't working, dampening the violin isn't working, you don't have a feedback destroyer in your backpack. Um, maybe the last ditch solution for you is that you're just going to have to turn that monitor down a little bit. Um, and that's obviously suboptimal, but maybe it's going to start a discussion with your band about, hey, fellas, I think we're a little too loud up here, okay? When your band's too loud on stage, it's also too loud out in the crowd, and it means that your front of house engineer doesn't have the control over your mix that he'd like to have, and probably most of what people in the audience are hearing are your monitors. They're pointing the wrong way. They're not going to sound great to people in the audience. You're going deaf, they're not getting a great show, your violin's feeding back, everything's terrible. So sometimes the answer is just, y'all need to turn down. And uh, we musicians don't really like that. Uh, we like to be loud, um, but because that's why we bought a pickup, right? We want to be loud. But you can be too loud, obviously, and sometimes feedback is a symptom of that problem. So that's sort of where we are. You've got EQ, you've got dampening, you've got movement from the speaker, you've got the phase button on your board or your DI, um, and maybe last ditch you're just going to have to turn down. So in any case, that's how we deal with feedback in an acoustic violin or an acoustic electric violin or a microphone or whatever. We got feedback, undesired feedback on a stage. Those are some of the weapons at your disposal. Thanks for watching and uh, we'll catch you guys next time.